que es tu cuerpo Y si te tengo nada más me faltará I'm so happy to welcome you to the Monastery of St. Catherine's here on Mount Sinai. This is the oldest continually inhabited Christian monastery in the world and has been preserved throughout history for 17 centuries. And it predates any divisions in the Christian faith. In fact, it was made around a place where people would pray, which was the place of the burning bush. Helen, who built many things in the Holy Land, also built a small chapel here that was eventually replaced by a large basilica built by Justinian in the 6th century. Uh, at the beginning, the monastery was referred to as the Holy Virgin. Why is that? Because the revelation of God at the burning bush was seen as a type of the Virgin Mary and the Incarnation. The monastery is also dedicated to, obviously, Moses and Elijah, who both came to this mountain, and they both spoke with Christ at the Transfiguration, which is the beautiful mosaic in the chapel. And most recently, the name is St. Catherine's Monastery because of Catherine's relics right here. This is an incredible place. Right now, it is a Greek Orthodox monastery, also giving testimony to the roots that at that time, the Christian-speaking world, well, the Christian world spoke Greek. And so that's why Greek is still spoke here today. Now, I want to tell you that the, mo the library in this monastery is filled with spiritual treasures. Of course, the most important spiritual treasures are the saints who uh, have been here in Sinai. In fact, there's 70 canonized saints that are honored by the church in this area. But the library has so many treasures in, as well. Manuscripts, early printed books, they're all in the library. And they're celebrated throughout the world because of their antiquity and their importance. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But the monastery is filled also with icons, some of the most important collection of pre-iconoclastic panel icons. That means um, made on wooden panels and they were never destroyed uh, or defaced as what happened with the iconoclastic heresy. So what a wonderful place to be. Let's go in and speak to one of the English-speaking monks here. He's actually an American monk named Father Justin. Why would the Lord have sent an American to a Greek Orthodox monastery? I mean, seriously, well, he had to, some amazing to save plans. Us all. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. The 1900, yeah. the only way to get here was a camel. People would go to Suez, they would organize a caravan with guides and porters, and it was eight days down the coast, one day to Faran, one day to Sinai. Ten, ten days from Suez. Ten days from ten days. Suez. And I was amazed when Ajiri came here in the fourth century. Isn't that remarkable? It was ten days from Suez. <laughs> really the same. So, so for, for 1700 years, it remained a ten day trek. Oh my goodness. And now you can do it in five hours. Yes. You have a toll road. Let me take you into the next room where are the manuscripts. We, could, we, I have, we had Greek ministers here yesterday and we're going to have a special group here tomorrow. So I've just left out the manuscripts that I brought out for the ministers. I could show you those and oh, we could talk about the library here and then we can come back and continue the conversation if you'd Great. like. I, I took out four manuscripts for important visitors who were here yesterday and I left them out on purpose to be able to show you as well. Oh, I'm so, so let me let me show you these and Thank then you can include much. these in your oh, presentation. Oh, wonderful. This is just beautiful. Let's, I almost don't even want to breathe them, close to them, you know. <laughs> I'll open them chronologically. <laughs> okay. This is a copy of the Psalter. Oh, wow. And it's written in parallel Greek and Arabic. Look at that. This dates from the 9th century. We know that Arab rule came here in the year 630. Mm -hmm. So that's early 7th century. By the 8th and 9th century, in Palestine and in Syria, Christians are speaking Arabic as their native language. And there was the need to have the scriptures translated into Arabic and the services translated into Arabic. This dates from the 9th century, so it was part of that wow. program to translate everything into Arabic. And this is very, very significant because it's written in two languages. It's parallel Greek and Arabic. That's just amazing. So it shows speakers of Greek and speakers of Arabic 
living in the same place, needing a manuscript to cater to both. And it's the Psalms of David. The Greek at the time was written in all capital letters with no word separations. That's and, the and, tough Greek, yes. <laughs> and the Arabic was written in Cufic letters, Oof. sometimes with very few points. So it's not, neither one is easy to read. I think mm -hmm. the Greek is easier to read if, if a person knows the, the Psalms. Uh, but it's so beautiful at an artistic level mm -hmm. to see Cufic Arabic. Which do you and, mean? And you can see where the skin was damaged when they mm -hmm. were shaving it down to make the parchment. Yes. And so as not to waste right. it, they stitched it together and oh, then just wrote, wrote around the stitches. Oh, that's incredible. Which, which psalm is this to you? Can you read it? Um, uh, 41. Psalm 41. See, the, the Greeks use letters for numbers. Oh, there you go. Yes. Oh, yes, of yes. course. Nice. But the Psalter that we read in church today is the Septuagint, mm -hmm. which is translated by the Jews 300 years before Christ. And uh, that's still the liturgical text that we use in the Orthodox Church today. So you could take a ninth century manuscript, read it in the services, if you had the ability to read the Greek, yes, yeah. and no one would know that you're reading a ninth century manuscript. That's so that's an incredible fabulous. example of continuity. Yes. In fact, I remember reading once that that was one of the attractions that you had. That's right. <laughs> yes, I remember that very well. Now, the, the next thing I'd like to show you is... Look at that case and um, cover. It's just beautiful. This is called um, Lectionary. It is the Gospels divided up for reading in the church. So there you go. What do you read the third Sunday after Easter? Mm -hmm. It's all divided up. And it's divided up so that you read the entire four Gospels in sequence through the liturgical year. Sounds familiar. This is, this is <laughs> open to the beginning of the passages from the Gospel of Luke. And on the left, you have a very, very beautiful illumination beautiful. of St. Luke. You see the curved knife for smoothing the parchment. Ah. And then there is a compartment for holding the quills and um, red ink and black ink. Those are the traditional colors. And he's poised beginning to write his gospel. These letters look like they're written also in gold. Uh, the the first page is all in gold wow. with a very, very beautiful frame. You see beautiful. a fountain, you see birds, you see peacocks, you even see little greyhounds. Oh. So these are emblems of an idyllic garden that, that surround the title. After that, the title and the oh. opening initial are made in gold, but the words are written with brown ink. And the red that you see is musical notation. Because oh, the, the Gospels sure. in, in a resonant acoustic are more clear if you intone them and not just read them in a spoken voice. Beautiful. So this is a very ancient system for the intonation of the Gospels. And you can see candle marks, you can see finger <laughs> marks. Can I touch which is, it? Can which I is all signs finger? that it was, it was actually used. It wasn't just... Uh, oh, this is very... Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. Can I also yes. use it? I'm going to touch it. Okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> when you, when, this is parchment, which is made yes. from animal skins, uh, calf it's skin, or sheep skin. It's very durable. Mm -hmm. This is over a thousand years old, and it's fresh, and it's new. And you That's think incredible. of um, the digital photographs we're taking today. Mm -hmm. Where will they be in a thousand years? <laughs> we yes. don't know. Yes. We hope they're still around. We yeah. don't know. <laughs> Because the technology is always shifting and always mm -hmm. changing, and you have to update everything. It's called migration. This but is, this is, is wonderful th to have in the card copy as well. Yes. Obviously. This is just lovely. So this is also, this wouldn't have been produced here probably, right? No. The, um, very few illuminated manuscripts were made here at Sinai. Sinai was the poor monastery at the edge of the world. Oh. <laughs> to, make a to make a manuscript like this, you need quality parchment, you need mm -hmm. gold leaf, you need pigments, and the pigments came from many different parts of the world. Sure. So this was uh, in Constantinople, they had the artisans yeah. and the clientele to commission such beautiful manuscripts. Would this one have, would have been from some of the monasteries in Syria, perhaps? Or, or it could have been uh, written here. This one, because it's not illuminated, yes, right? Yes. That's, yeah, it also and, has and the Arabic, of course. Locally, there would have been a need for Greek and Arabic together. Makes sense. Beautiful. The third manuscript that I'd like to show you is a copy of the most important manuscript written here. Uh. There was an abbot here in the 
late 6th and early 7th that century. That is just beautiful. Named uh, John, and because he wrote a manuscript called The Ladder, he's called this is Saint John, John of the Ladder. Look at this. Yeah. And this is the most illuminated manuscript that we have. This there, is so exciting. There are 30 <laughs> steps in The Ladder, and for every step there's an illumination, and some of the steps are very lengthy, and so there are mm -hmm. intermediate illuminations. So there's about over 40 illuminations in this manuscript. Would that be And him? this is my favorite because it shows a beautiful border with shades of blue yes. uh, and the gold and highlights in red. And it shows monks standing in prayer and Christ blessing yeah. above. And on the side, you see the Virgin Mary. She's standing on a footstool. Yeah. And the three monks are venerating her. She has her hands out, outstretched in prayer mm -hmm. and Christ blesses the monks and you, and and everything is so tiny yes. but it's so exact so should, would this be one that he may have actually written or when no, it was written no, when he was the is, abbot this, probably no, no this is um 12th century okay so many but, hundreds but, of years after but um there's a possibility it was made here that's amazing we don't know for sure so wonderful. But it is, it is a possibility, and it would have been an appropriate manuscript to make here at such a high artistic level. So this is actually a copy of the latter. We have leaves that date from within 100 years of St. John himself. Unfortunately, we don't have the original manuscript. We wish we did. <laughs> now, the illuminated one that's in the museum, is that from... That's from in, in the museum, the, yes. we have the oldest surviving leaves, which mm -hmm. date from 100 years of St. John. We have a Greek manuscript with the latter added in the margin. Okay. And we have an Arabic translation that was made in 1612. And it has a traditional depiction of the latter with Christ at the top, <laughs> but it's all in the Persian style. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's very, very interesting. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. And the last thing I'd like to show you is another copy of the four Gospels. Oh, wow. This was written in Crete. Oh, wow, yes. By yes. an artist who did both the calligraphy and the illumination. Look at that. His name was Ioannis Rosos. And if you Google his name, you'll see oh, a, a, an extensive record on him because this is a manuscript of the four Gospels that he made when he was a young man on his native Crete. Hmm. But then the later 1400s is when they were trying to further the knowledge of Greek and establishing libraries in Florence and uh, many other important places where they had manuscripts of the classical texts. Hmm. And so he left Crete, went to Italy, spent the rest of his life writing manuscripts of classical texts for important patrons, including Cardinal Visarion. Oh, interesting. And okay. today in the British Library, some of their most beautiful manuscripts of the Iliad and the Odyssey are written by the same scribe. Isn't that interesting? This, well, if so, you look at this, so, it looks so very... This is um, yeah. a work that he did as a young man on his native Crete, and then he, he spent the rest of his life writing manuscripts for wealthy patrons in Italy. <laughs> and, but you said and he you, was a monk. You can see that, that, yeah. that, that he, um, he also did the illuminations. They're in a softer style uh -huh. than the Byzantine illuminations. Yes, I was going to say it looks very, quite honestly, it looks very Italian in the but, way that but it's made. He, uh, he had a beautiful script, and many times in the margins, he would use the margin to make a flourish. Oh, wow. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's a joy to read these texts because they're written with such expertise. Oh, they're just gorgeous. It is really beautiful. This is so beautiful. Those are the four things I'd like to show you. Thank you. It's kind of exciting to be the uh, librarian here. Well, we <laughs> have relied on the expertise of many experts who've come here and given us advice. One of the big questions was, should we make an artificial climate? Mm -hmm. Most people say it's too dry here. We should put uh, humidifiers, oh. raise the humidity levels. But then when we gave that serious thought, people were saying it would have been a big mistake if you had done that because it's changes that cause deterioration and where they have been for centuries oh. under natural conditions, just keep them under natural conditions. That's very because good. Because what we find here is that the, the fatal combination is high heat and high humidity. Mm -hmm. And when it's hotter in the summer, we have about 20% humidity. <laughs> and when it rains in the winter, it's cold. So the heat and the humidity are always moving in opposite directions. 
And that's why, by nature, we have excellent climate for the preservation of the manuscripts. So you could say that these are your four favorites in a certain way. Well, there are many favorites, but these are, <laughs> these are four. They're definitely favorites. Now, the, the uh, Bible that's in the museum, the sheet, well, the parchment, I think, of the Greek Biblicus Sinaticus. Yes. That is the only one of two sheets that are still here. No, no. The rest um, were... I know the it, whole it, tragic story of how okay. that was taken away. It was away. all here tragic. until 1844, and then it began to be dispersed because of Constantine Tischendorf. Today, 18 leaves are here and 18. 40 fragments. We have leaves in Leipzig, the university library. Some are still in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. The manuscript was taken to St. Petersburg in 1859 so that they could publish it with the original there for consultation on the promise that it be returned. Yeah. And once it was published, it was the oldest Bible known at the time. Even today, it's still the oldest complete New Testament. It became sensational. Yep. And some people in Russia said, we're obligated to return this. Others people, including the emperor, said, let's not be too hasty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and yeah. It was never returned. Yes. In 1933, when Stalin was desperate for money, he offered it to England. They raised what was at that time a colossal amount of money. It's one of the great treasures of the British Library. Right. Bring but, them but over, in, bring them in, over, in convince in them. In 2003, we decided to set aside our differences over the history of the manuscript to cooperate. And then we conserved and we photographed them, all the existing leaves and fragments. And the result was that everything is today on the internet and can be read by anyone. And the, the officials of the British Library said in their experience, even if you have everything on the internet, people still want the facsimile. So we published a quality facsimile, but we kept all the processes, machine process, to keep the price low. <laughs> so people can buy a facsimile of the Codex Sinaiticus in this massive, very, very heavy volume for $500, wow. which is achievable for small libraries of and course. serious scholars. I'm sure that the, um, the monks here in the monastery pray for all of the pilgrims, including future pilgrims and, and virtual pilgrims. So mm -hmm. we'll count on those prayers, Father Justin. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.